Okay. Well, I want to go to Genesis 15, and I want to um, talk about covenant because we're living in some dark days, and we need to have a good understanding of God is an awesome God, and that He really does loves us enough that He sent His Son. That's what our faith is based on us having faith and belief in the Creator God and that He sent His Son to um, pay for us. He redeemed us. He purchased us back with His blood. We are in covenant with Him. We are in a contract with Him. And He won't break the contract because the contract was started a long time ago. And we need to know that, but we not only do we need to know it, we need to live like we believe it. We need to live holy. We need to live with our hearts and our minds on Him. We need to seek His heart, His face through His Word so that we can be His representative here on this earth. And that's really important today more than I think any other period of time in history because the enemy is hard at work trying to bring about an aim. The scripture says the enemy knows the scripture and he trembles. So he knows the word better than the people who confess or profess Christ as their redeemer. And as a result, those who are worshiping him, they are working with Satan to bring about an end time because they want souls. It's about your soul. And so I'm going to reread again what I read to you week before last. I was a bit under the weather last week and we didn't get to pick up on this like I had intended, so I'm going to try to pick it up from where I had intended to do last week. So in the 15th chapter of Genesis, and we're going to start in verse 1, it says, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram, his name was Abram at this time, in a vision, saying, Fear not, don't be afraid, okay, Abram, I am thy shield, and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. It's the same Damascus that was bombed, okay? So the Bible is talking about the same things that is in our modern daytime. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Abraham believed in the Lord, and the Lord counted it to Abraham for righteousness. He didn't have to do anything. All he had to do was believe God. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of Chaldees, to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Now Abraham is asking a question. And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So he, this, all of these various animals, people were able, if you go through the law, they were able to purchase these based on their financial status in life. So God included everybody. If only you can afford a pigeon or a turtle dove, you 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 were you were included in this covenant God is about to break or cut. And he took unto him all these and divided them. Abraham took unto him all these that the Lord instructed him and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcass, carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Abram, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them. 
and they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve, I, the Lord, will judge. I will judge. And afterward shall they come out with great substance. I'm not getting into this today, but because of this one verse of scripture, a whole lot of lies have been perpetrated in the earth so that the people who, the, who this scripture is talking about for hundreds of years hasn't known who they were. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, Abram. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So God has a certain period of time. He will allow sin to go on. And then when it reach a, a time that God determines that is full, he's going to deal with people. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, and it was dark. Behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. It was after it was dark and a deep sleep had fallen on Abram. And the same day of the Lord made, and the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram. God made the covenant, not Abram. We can't make covenants. God made the covenant. Saying unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. God gave it to Abram. Let me give you the definition of covenant. It's a Hebrew word. It's called bereth. B-E-R-I-Y-T-H. It's derived from a root word means to cut. C-U-T. Covenant is a cutting Dividing of animals into two parts and the contracting parties passing between them. As we can see here in verse 17, and it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. It wasn't Abraham, it was God. Passing through the pieces. God cut the covenant with Abram. And it was forever. Okay. Let's go to Genesis. I'm sorry. Galatians. And we need to be rooted and grounded. In this understanding and belief. There's so much confusion. And deception taking place in the world. That it makes it hard to understand. Who to listen to and who to believe. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit and we need our own personal relationship with God. So that when somebody speaks something that's not right, if you know God and you know the Word and you have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is going to convict you and He's going to help you to be able to discern that what you're hearing is not of Him. And if you don't have that type of relationship with the Lord, you need to seek to have it because it is available to anyone who would ask or who would believe. And I'm, I'm really doing my level best to sound an alarm that everybody needs to have that relationship with God because this eternity is forever. And the enemy is after your eternal soul. The scripture says, fear the one who has the power to destroy both the body and the soul. So the enemy wants to destroy your soul by causing you to cooperate with him to do evil and to rebel against God and reject the truth. The scripture says those who reject, who did not have a love for the truth, God is the one who sends the spirit of delusion. So I find myself often asking the Lord to please help me not to be deluded. I pray for God to help me to not be a rejecter of the truth. And I'm sharing to, with you me. Because I make mistakes. I'm not perfect. I don't believe any one person knows everything there is to know about God. So what we need to do is love each other, not be critical and scrutinize each other, but and celebrate each other. Pray for each other. I'm telling you the most powerful thing you have on earth, if you really believe in Jesus Christ and what he did, is prayer. If you see someone missing the mark, 
and then you see and can discern that they're trying to give you their best, you need to pray for that person if they're missing it in any kind of way. Because so much lies and deception has been perpetrated in the earth. We all are trying to rebuild a foundation, a better foundation. We all are searching for the truth, those of us who are awake and realize that Christmas and Easter and all of those pagan things was not biblical. Am I making sense to you? So I'm giving my best. I love the Lord. I love his people. I know I don't get everything right, but I do my level best to try to give it, get it right. And I would encourage everyone to do the same. Because we are here to be God's witnesses, to be his light, to be an example, to convict people by the way we live and the way we treat each other to want what we have. They ought to want our God. We ought to be able to provoke people to jealousy because we don't act like everyone else. People ought to be able to recognize who we are without us having to say anything. And sometimes that comes with a cost because people have spirits in them that will hate you because you are not acting the way the other people are acting. And that's what the enemy is trying to destroy. Anyone in the earth who believes what we're reading in these verses of scripture, the enemy is going to be after to just kill, steal, and destroy. Am I making sense? All right, in Galatians chapter 3. Let's look at verse 8. Well, we can start at 6. It says, Even as Abraham, now his name has been changed. He's not Abram, he's Abraham. Believe God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know you therefore that which they which are of faith, the people who have faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham. So this scripture is saying before the gospel came in the earth, God was preaching to Abraham that you have to be justified by believing. It's not by your blood line, even though God is going to deal with the bloodline Jews or the, the bloodline Hebrews. He has a special covenant with them. But that covenant through Abraham and faith, it has been extended to the heathens or the Gentiles. And it says, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, And thee, Abraham, shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So if you're not able to do everything that is written in the law and you're trying to live according to the law and not by faith, this scripture is saying you are cursed. And when I say law, I'm not saying, I don't know why people want to twist it. Because we are supposed to morally live forever according to the laws of God, the moral laws. You know, we're not supposed to cheat, steal, lie, murder, commit adultery, and all of those things. We have to live according to those. That, that's God's laws forever in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But the works of the law to make us right with God, we are not able to do those works. And we are not even able to live holy, morally, without the spirit of the living God living on the inside of us to lead us, to guide us, to teach us, to convict us, to be so that we, if we're leading by the Spirit and we are sensitive to, to the Spirit, He's able to tell us whether to go to the left or to right or to the right or just be still. We need the Holy Spirit of God to live out God's moral ways and laws and statutes and ordinances. Am I making sense? Okay, so I'm going to read verse 10 again. It says, For as many as are of the works of the law under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man, underline, that no man is justified. The word justified means justice, though you never did anything wrong. By the law, 
by the law in the sight of God. It is evident that no one is made right by the law in the sight of God. So if you care about God, then you have to do it his way. It says the just, those who just, as though they never did anything wrong, shall live by faith. And right now we need faith. Because the things that we see coming on the earth, the Bible says in Luke 21, that your heart can faint. For the things that the evil, we, we, are, we are pilgrims, we are foreigners in this land. Satan is the God of this world and we are the sheep of God's pasture. And the enemy is trying to destroy us physically as sheep, but our soul spiritually. Am I making sense? All right. Verse 12, and the law is not of faith. The law is not of faith, but the man does that. The man that does them shall live in them. So if you're using the law to live by, you're not justified in the sight of God. And you that's what you're living by. Verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. That we might receive the promise. The same promise that God made to Abraham back in Genesis 15. The promise of the Spirit through faith. The Holy Spirit. See, Spirit is capitalized. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be not a man's, underline, though it be not a man's covenant. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man, if it be confirmed, no man disannouns or adds thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He says not and to seeds. Talking about Jesus. It was Abra Christ is Abraham's seed that the scripture is talking about. Okay. As of many. It's not seeds as of many but as of one. And to thy seed. It's making it clear. Thy seed which is Christ. That's who the promise of faith came through. Jesus Christ, the seed of Abraham, who is going to make all the nations of the, word, of the world blessed through Abraham, talking about Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God, the covenant was confirmed before of God, Genesis 15, and Christ. The law which was 430 years after cannot disannul that should make the promise of non-effect. This is saying that the covenant was made 430 years with Abraham before the law came into place. The covenant was made with Abraham and that covenant cannot be disannulled. God's covenant with Abraham cannot be disannulled. Am I making sense? For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. And it is of promise because that's where it all started in Genesis 15. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. God made a promise to Abraham. God entered a covenant with Abraham. God cut the covenant with Abraham by blood. Am I making sense to you? It cannot be broken. It cannot be disannulled. God is honorable and faithful and just and trustworthy. And if we believe in him, if we believe in his son, we, sh we should rest in him. Be at peace in him. Have confidence in him. Don't worry about what's going on in the world. Just make sure your election and your calling is sure with God. Now I want to turn to Hebrews and then we're going to come back to Romans. We're going to come to Romans. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 9. We're living in some really dark days. 
And we can see all the things that the enemy is doing by our natural eyes and our natural ears. But God tells us that we walk by faith and not by sight. And that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word. So we, we need to hear some word today. It says in verse 12. For I will be merciful. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong scripture. Verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves. But by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. He obtained eternal redemption for us with his own blood, not the blood that was shed at the time that the covenant was cut with Abraham, because the the Lamb of God, the seed, is Christ, and he, by his own blood, redeemed us. We are in covenant with him. He purchased us with his own blood. Let's turn now back to Romans. Romans chapter 4. Is this making sense? Romans chapter 4. It's, it's really something else to see the level of darkness and confusion and deception. And it's, it's, it's layered. <laughs> so you have to pull back layer by layer to try to discern and understand what's going on. And the scripture says even the elect can be fooled in these, in these last days. And Romans chapter 4 verse 11 it says, He received a sign, talking about Abraham, of circumcision. A seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe. Abraham is the father, not of by the just by the flesh, but all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that the righteousness might be imputed unto them also. You see that? And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only. So he's talking about Jews. Not really Jews, but the Judites. Because <laughs> Jews is really, <laughs> I, I don't even want to get into that. But who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world. See, it's not just the it's not just the Hebrews, but of the world of all into anybody in the world who believes. Because you can be a Buddha, you can be a Muslim, you can be Hindu, and you can leave those faith and put your faith in Jesus Christ, and then that then you become adopted into the household of faith. If you believe in Jesus Christ, not all of those other things. Anybody in the world has that opportunity available to, to them. And this is what we should be concerned about is speaking the gospel. That's what the good news is. You don't have to die lost. Not about being rich financially. Verse 13. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law. It didn't come through the law. But through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be as faith is made void, and the promise made of non-effect. So the promise that God made to Abraham, if people have to keep the law to be made right with God, then what God promised to Abraham is canceled out, is, is of non-effect. Because the promise that God made to Abraham was by faith. Abraham was faithful. Abraham believed God. And that's where we are. We got to come to a place where we believe God. We take God at his word. And we don't allow anyone to pull us away from believing in his word. It says, verse 15, because the law works wrath. <laughs> For where no law is, there was no transgression. Therefore, it is our faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. 
as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Abraham is the father of many nations. Anyone who would believe. And this, this is scripture. So anybody who want to argue, don't argue with me. I'm just sharing the scripture as I understand it, as I believe it, as I try to live it. And I try to live it to the best of my human ability. When I fall short and the Holy Spirit convicts me, I repent or I confess my sins. Look down at verse 21. It says, And being fully persuaded that what he, God, had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Abraham was fully persuaded. And today, because of the darkness and the evil things that we see are taking place, we need to find a place in God where we can be fully persuaded. Because God is the only one who can help us. He's the only one who can guide you. He's the only one who can provide for you. He's the only one who can do anything that you need done. And you can't get anything from him without faith. Am I making sense to you? All right, let's turn to Romans 8. Before we go to Romans 8, I want to go back and read. I had read to you all two weeks ago the uh, Protocols of the Golden Dawn. And I was looking for a portion in it that at the time I couldn't find. So I'm, go I'm going to go back and reread some of that because it fits with what I'm sharing with you about covenant. It says in, ver in Protocol 9, baptize humanity into the golden dawn. The event will involve a spiritual baptism, a ritual to mark the release from all forms of bondage. The ritual marks the act of being absolved of all debts, all blackmail control files, all oaths, and this is the part I wanted to get to, and I did read this last time. All soul contracts. Our souls are under a covenant, a contract with God, because that's what a covenant is, it's a contract. Okay? So we need to make sure we don't cooperate with the enemy out of ignorance to break our contract with God for the sake of finances. Debt being canceled. All of that. Because the enemy knows you have to agree with him to give up your soul. So I think this is really interesting. The other part I didn't get to that I wanted you to see. It says in, in, what, in number 5. I think this is under protocol 7 but number 5. It says what can be revealed however is that the non-Semitic origins of the Ashkenazim will be acknowledged. So everybody knows that the people in Israel are not, not, not the Hebrews, not from the line of Shem. Okay? And their real homeland identified as Gazaria. The original plot of the Rothschilds to sacrifice the nation of Israel, which they also created via the Balfour Declaration to fulfill their plot to trigger World War Three will also be revealed, which is what they're trying to do right now. There's a battle going on. They're trying to start World War Three. The enemy is trying to bring about the end of days before it's God time for it to happen. It says the true Semites, Sephardic Jews of Israel and Muslims of Palestine will be united by the acknowledgement of their shared oppression and exploitation at the hands of the Zionists. This is still not true because they still don't want to recognize who the real Hebrews are. But at least in this thing, you can see that they know who wrote this protocol that the people who are in Israel are not the Shemites or the Hebrews. Everybody knows that. I, I was listening to something else. Ancient alien people was saying that people need to come to the acknowledgement of who the real Hebrews are. And that was sort of mind-blowing. Now, I want to switch gears a little bit. Because the enemy looks at us human beings as though we are cattle, we are sheep. We are, a sheep 
follows the shepherd. If a sheep falls down, it needs the shepherd to pick it up because it's not able to pick itself up. If you study really the life of a sheep and a shepherd, and the Lord used sheep as a metaphor for us because we follow, we, we follow those who, who have a strong personality to lead. And we can be led, like the scripture says, Jesus was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and he didn't even open his mouth. We have, we have the sheep type mentality, and so God used sheep as a metaphor for people. So let's turn to Psalms 100. Because the enemy sees us as food. Literally. And I want you to look up the word pedivore, P-E-D-O, V as in Victor, O-R-E, P-E-D-O-V-O-R-E. -E. I'm not going to get into it, but you look it up, and then you come to your own conclusions. But in Psalms 100, this is who we are, verse 3, know you that the Lord he is God, the Father God, He is God. It is He that has made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. We are His people and we are the sheep of His pasture. Turn to Psalm 79. We are the sheep. We are His people. And people are synonymous with sheep in God's eyes. And in the enemy's eyes too. Psalm 79, look at verse 13. It says again, We are thy people, and sheep of thy pasture will give thee thanks forever. We will show forth thy praise to all generations. We, should, we have sheep and we ought to be showing forth praise. No matter how many generations, that should be forever. We are his sheep, we are his people, and we should be praising him, worshiping him, honoring him. Now let's turn to John chapter 10. Everybody knows this scripture. And I want you to look at it from a perspective of being a sheep. And I want you to look at the definition when you get a chance of the word pedivore. Because you know how human beings will go hunting for deer and for uh, sheep. And you know you don't hunt for sheep, but you will, you will slaughter a sheep for food. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are, we are the sheep that those who are worshiping Satan is trying to slaughter. Okay, we like sheep. In chapter 10 of John, look at verse 9. It says, Jesus speaking, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. So you only can enter in and be saved through him. Okay? And shall go in and out and you will find pastor. You will find what you need through him. The thief who is Satan, comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus still speaking, I am come that they might have life. God wants you to have life and that they might have it in, a, in more abundance. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. He gave his life for us. But he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep because the sheep is running trying to hide. The hireling flees because he isn't hireling and cares not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knows me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Okay? God 
lays down his life. He laid down, Jesus laid down his life for his sheep. He laid down his life for us. He laid his life down for us. Okay? Go to Romans again, 8. I just want this to be so in your heart that you have peace and you have hope and you have confidence that you won't be afraid because we can't fix or change the things that's taking place in the earth, but we can pray for those souls who are lost and we can pray for each other that we don't break rank, that we endure until the end. And that's what we should be doing, praying, praying. The scripture says pray without ceasing. We need to be praying all the time. Okay, Romans 8. But look at verse 36. It says, as it is, as it is written. This is what people don't, don't want to hear. For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep. For the slaughter. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. We are sheep. Now, and the enemy is trying to slaughter us. But we don't think about it like that. We don't we, we see ourselves as human beings, which we are, but in the spiritual realm, the battle that's taken place, we are as sheep counted for the slaughter. All the day long. The enemy is just trying to come up with any type of way he can to slaughter us. Okay, so we need to, to be aware of that. Turn to 1 Corinthians. I just want to saturate you in Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Stay faithful to God. Stay true. Don't live an immoral life. Ask God to help you to, to shun lust. You know, Whatever it is you're struggling with, if you've confessed it and asked God for his help, you're, making it, you're bringing it to him and saying, Lord, this is what I'm struggling with. I need help. I don't want to be like this. I don't want to be rebellious. I don't want to be at odds with you. I want to be useful. I want to be a blessing. Help me. Help me in the areas where I'm struggling and I'm missing the mark. Acknowledge it. Acknowledge it to yourself. Okay? At 1 Corinthians 6, look at verse... 20. Let's, well, let's start at 19, 18. It says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man does is without the body, but he that commits fornication sins against his own body. What? You didn't know that? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. If you are in Christ, you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You've been bought with a price. Don't give up your soul. Don't break covenant with God. Stay faithful. Stay connected. Turn to Ephesians. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verse 14. It says, which is the earnest of our inheritance? Well, let's go up to 13. It says, in whom you also have trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that you believed, you were sealed. You were sealed. With that Holy Spirit of promise. Which is the earnest. It's a down payment of our inheritance. Until the redemption of the purchased possession. Until the praise of his glory. 
you've been already purchased. But the, you have a down payment, which is the Holy Spirit that has sealed you. But the process is not yet completed in this respect. Turn back now to Romans. And I'll show it to you. Romans 8. If you die, your spirit is sealed. Your spirit is redeemed, is, is saved. If you, if, you, if you die in faith. Romans 8. Let's look at verse 18. It's for, it says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption, of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. We're still waiting for the redemption of the body. So the body is still subject to sickness, to pains, to groaning, to suffering. It's your spirit that has been saved, but your body is still here being subject to the evil things that's taken place. That's why you have to have faith. You serve God with your spirit, man. It's you, them who worship God, worship him in spirit and in truth. It's your spirit that has been redeemed and saved. So if you if your, when your flesh ceases to exist in this realm, if you die, if this body dies, then the real who you are, the spirit is redeemed. But then there's going to come a time when the body is going to put on immortality. You're going to get a new body that won't ever die. But that hasn't happened yet. You're still living in this carnal body that is still subject to lust and, and, and evil things. But if you let your spirit lead you, and not your body, because your body is not redeemed. Your body is going to get you in trouble if you listen to your body. That's why you need faith. You do what is right based on the word of God, not what your your soul or your mind tell you to do. Because your, your soul is going to go, your body is going to follow whoever's in control. If your spirit is in control, then your spirit is and it's connected to God. It's not your 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 soul and your body is not going to commit sin. But the enemy is able to afflict you in the soulish realm. Your mind, your will, your emotion. And he uses that to try to destroy your, your eternal soul. Am I making sense to you? So, love Jesus. Appreciate what he did. I, I have too many scriptures to share. I'll be here all day. But do the best you can to be right. And the first way is in, the, in Hebrews 11, it says it's impossible to please God without faith. You have to have faith. What pleased God about Abraham is God. Abraham believed God. And it was accounted to him as righteousness. So if we be seed or heir with Abraham, joint heirs with Christ, it's by entering into a relationship with God the Father through Christ. And I might not be saying it this just the right way, but I'm sure those of you who know me, you understand me, how I speak. And what it is that I'm saying to you. Because I've shared this before. I build from week after week after week. And most of you who are in our ministry have been with me since we started. Some years ago. Back in 1997 or 98. So you're familiar with me. I'm familiar with you. We love each other. And we are a family. And we appreciate all of you who join us on YouTube to listen to the things that the Lord shares through me. I'm doing the best I understand. I don't hate anybody. I'm not angry with anybody. I'm a lady. I don't wear hand covering and I don't do all of those things. And I'm still trying to come to an understanding of what it is, if anything different, that the Lord would have me do. Until then, I'm doing the best I know and understand to do. Okay? Be blessed.